Hello and welcome to another episode of the Doster and Deshaun podcast here on the Field of 68 Media Network. My name is Rob Doster. Of course, I am joined by my co-host, the one and only Deshaun Butler, former All-American at West Virginia University. He's going to have something to say to me about the way that his Mountaineers played over the course of the last week. So we have plenty to get into there. It was a wild first weekend in college basketball. Deshaun, I am so excited that we can finally talk ball on this podcast. It's been too long since we had actual basketball games to discuss. I couldn't be more excited. How you doing, man? How was your Thanksgiving? How was your holiday? Are you still in a turkey coma? Uh, yes, most definitely still am in a turkey coma. Most definitely. Uh, the weekend was great. Um, what do we do? Watch nothing but basketball. The uh, kids were very angry with me. I had the TV on smash <laughs> for a while and then they kicked me off the television and then I had to use the laptops. Shout out to my guy, Robbie Hummel. I saw your setup. Your setup was pretty uh, lavish and my, my two laptops got me by though. So, uh, my kids were hogging the television with a uh, wrestling video game. So my, my weekend was beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Tons of basketball, tons of new players that I've never seen before. And I got to see so many different styles of basketball games and, co- and coaching. And it was just great to see the game again. Yeah, it, it really was. And, and I'm right there with you. If the kids see on the TV, what my son's favorite thing <laughs> to do is now is like, I've put the remote down, he runs over and he grabs it and he's figured out how to turn the TV on and turn it off and yeah. how to go to like the on demand screen. He doesn't know how to find Peppa Pig or anything like that on the on-demand screen, but he knows how to get there. So that's his new favorite thing to do. It's it's a lot of fun when you're in the middle of a game and you're like sweating out a cover or there's like one minute left in overtime and you're like, okay, why are you changing the channel on me? I'm trying to watch the end of this game. I need to figure out what's going to happen. I got to talk about it on the Doster and Deshaun pot. What are you doing to me? So yeah, my, uh, our, our Thanksgiving was good, man. I, uh, I smoked a 16 pound turkey for six people, which is just like, I have, I'm going to be eating turkey for the next week. You know, this is the first time that we've ever hosted Thanksgiving and I've never had this many leftovers ever in my fridge. My fridge is nothing. It's still, we're we're three days later. My fridge is still nothing but Thanksgiving leftovers, but I'm not complaining. My wife, my wife right now, she's making dinner and you know what it is? It's turkey and cheese and stuffing grilled cheese sandwiches. Yeah. We've been eating sandwiches the last couple of days. We've, we've, we've gone from uh, just the plates of leftovers to, sandwiches now we've we've escalated there I'm, I'm a big thanksgiving leftover sandwich guy of course of course yeah i'm a big big fan of that all right uh we have a lot to talk about and we do have a lot to get into so we're just going to jump right to it but before we do i want to let you guys know about uh our new sponsor on the podcast home field apparel um if you guys are unaware home field apparel is a premium collegiate apparel brand out of indianapolis it's incredibly comfortable gear great t-shirts i got my uconn shirt on right here. This is not the lucky t-shirt. I'm not wasting the luck on a podcast with you. I need to save the luck in the lucky UConn t-shirt for when I'm actually betting on games. So I don't have it on right now. I just have my, my, my regular, my, my UConn logo. See my favorite thing, what they do, Deshaun, and the reason why I really, really like this company and I I wanted to associate with them is they go through and they mine all of like the old logos and the throwback logos from the fifties and the sixties and the seventies from the past of your program. They license them. They make it all legal and they go and they recreate these designs and they make these awesome t-shirts. And, and, and look, the designs are great, but the key to a good t-shirt is whether or not it's comfortable. And look, we talked about this last week, right? The neck is right. The arm sleeves are right. It's the perfect tightness right around your waist. So like you really can't complain about how comfortable the t-shirts are. Um, I, I just, I, I know it sounds like I'm trying to really sell it because I am, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm not just being sponsored. We're not just being sponsored by this, this apparel brand. It's something that I've actually spent money on myself. Uh, so it's nice to actually be able to be sponsored by them. So now I can get 20% off by using the promo code field of 68. And the last thing I have to mention this because West Virginia, your alma mater is not yet licensed by home field apparel, but this hurts. This hurts. If you, if you want to, if Deshaun, if you want some West Virginia gear, this is what you got to do. Okay. You tweet at them at Home Field Apparel. There's no E in apparel. It's Home Field A P P A R L. No. Tweet at them and let them know what school you want. So all you West Virginia fans that are tuning in to listen to Deshaun Butler right now, to, li- to listen to him, put me in a body bag for my West Virginia <laughs> basketball takes. Tweet at Home Field Apparel, no E in apparel, and let them know you want that West Virginia gear. Because I know there are some really awesome old school uh, Mountaineer logos that you want to get your hands on. So. With that in mind, Deshaun, we're going to roll through five questions 
on today's podcast that that we have that we came up with coming from the first weekend of college basketball. And I think the most important one we have to talk about is Gonzaga the best team in college basketball right now. You, would you like to take the honors or you want me to start yeah, it off? You go ahead because I, I, my, my, I have very strong takes on this. So I'm going to let you have the floor first. I have a very strong take on this as well. Yeah. <laughs> they are a very talented team uh, that I got a chance to see uh, this weekend. Uh, starting with Drew Timmy. I'm not going to lie to you. I heard a lot of talk about Luca Garza and Luca Garza has made his name uh, very clear this weekend, <laughs> by the way. So don't take this the wrong way. But I am a big fan. I got a chance to see some other guys as well this weekend. I got a chance to see Jay Huff. I got a chance to see Sam Hauser. I see. I saw, saw a lot of guys this weekend. Bigs, mobile bigs. Drew Timmy is amazing, bro. Like I really like enjoy watching him play. He's very talented. Can move very. Just the fact that he's as mobile as he is, and as I won't, I won't go to the extremes of saying he's like this sick, sick athlete, but he's just enough athletic to match his mo- his mobility can shoot the ball mid range, step out there, knock down the three finishes very well around the basket. Like I was just very impressed with him getting a chance to actually sit down and watch him. That was my number one take. And it wasn't just because it's my number one take doesn't mean it's the best take. <laughs> Two, I was very surprised at how Kispert shot the ball, like not shot the ball. Cause he's a, known as a great shooter. I was surprised at how poised he was during, during the mm-hmm. entire, the entire weekend. Like he didn't get rattled one at at one point in time in the game. You could see people, even Timmy, from t- certain points in time in the game, you would see a little fluctuation, and then he have a spurt where he score. Kispert was solid the entire the entirety of the weekend. Like I I very much liked his game, and you can see how much it helps to have a leader on your team, a senior leader. We'll get to that later on in the show with like certain teams, Kentucky, and then <laughs> and then uh. <laughs> But the the cake that took the cake was Suggs, bro. Like, I was just so impressed with him, his very first game. Like, super impressed. Just watching how much he controlled the pace of the game. Now, the, in the very beginning of the game, he started out strong. And then, you know, obviously, Timmy and, and Corey Clint came and they took over. But second half, man, it was – it was – there was no confusion, like, to me, who had the best outing as a freshman. Like it, it was, it wasn't even close, and the team did a very good job as as far as Gonzaga, just doing everything they could to support those three guys in the court. Yeah, and I'm was, I'm 100 right. with you. They're the best team in college basketball. I don't yeah. think it's close. Uh, my hottest take is that by the end of the season, we're going to be talking about Gonzaga in the same conversation as like. 2012 Kentucky and 2015 Kentucky and 2018 Villanova and 2009 North Carolina as like one of yeah as one of the best college basketball teams that we've seen in in recent years and it's because we've never seen a Gonzaga team that has this much talent on it like Corey Kispert right now could play a role for a team in the NBA because of, of what he does, the poise you mentioned, the way he can shoot, the fact that he's I don't people don't realize he's six seven. Right. He's not he's not a great athlete, but he's a better athlete than people believe that he is because he's just some white guy with floppy hair and a, the, the headband on. Right. So he's a good positional defender. He understands where he's supposed to be. You're never going to catch him out of position. He's not going to make a mistake on that. He'll get beat because, you know, he's somewhat limited in terms of what he can do physically. But the way that he could shoot, the poise that he has. The fact that he accepts that three and D role, like he could play yeah. in the NBA right now. Like he would have been a top probably 45 pick if he left in last year's draft. Drew Timmy, how often do you see guys that size with that kind of footwork? Like he played David McCormick off the court. Bill Self, who is one of like two coaches that always wants to have two bigs on the floor. I mean, you know this. He always yeah. wants to have two bigs on the floor. He went with five guards. Shout out to my guy Chris Stone on Twitter who started calling uh, Kansas. <laughs> they started calling him Villanova instead of Villanova because uh, they were playing so five so guards. <laughs> yeah. I've never actually seen that. I haven't seen that in a while. We had to put four, yeah. four wings to guards on the floor. And I was, that was telling. Yes, it really was. Like Drew Timmy played Dave McCormick right off the floor. But I mean, look, you are 100% right in that this was Jalen Suggs' team, that game against Kansas. Like the second half that he had, he completely took over. And it was, there were, 
there were so many plays there where it was just the small things that he was able to do, like reading a ball screen, being able to get to the basket, making a three um, when a defender goes under a ball screen. But there were two that really stood out to me, and I don't know if you remember these. Um, The first one came with about 15 minutes left. It was the possession after Kansas tied it to 57. And Kansas ices, right? You got Christian Brown icing the screen, forcing Jalen Suggs to his left. And there have been two times where he hit Drew Timmy on a roll with what, like a little um, a little pocket pass. So the weak side defender, the third man, is reading that. So he takes a step over. Suggs sees that happening, and he makes a pass over Timmy's head to hit Joel Ayayi in the weak side corner for a wide open three, and he threw the pass before Joel Ayayi A was there and B was even looking. So he made a pass to a guy that he saw was open before the dude even recognized that he was open. Like that takes a high level of basketball acumen to be able to make that pass. The other one was he comes off of a, comes off of a ball screen and he has like the little hesitation, hang dribble, like 20, 26 feet away from the basket, right? Waits for that one second. And basically from a standstill, one dribble layup through four Kansas defenders. Like you should not be able, if you're six foot four, whatever he is, one dribble from a standstill, 26 feet away from the basket, to a layup through four defenders like that, that kind of explosiveness you just can't teach. Not so I, I, I was, I was so unbelievably impressed with with Jalen Suggs and just kind of the Gonzaga's never had like they've had talent, they've had big guys, they've had good wings, they've never had a point guard like him. And to me, that's the difference maker. My only issue, <laughs> and it's not even an issue because it it didn't prove to be an issue against Kansas, but right. they, I mean they're. They didn't play Kansas again. Like they played a different, you know, a different team the, the following game. And it's not the exact same as, you know, playing Kansas. I wonder what they do when they play against bigger teams. Obviously, you can have the advantage. I wouldn't say small ball, but they 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 can have the advantage of quickness on some bigger teams. But I wonder if they can do this with bigger skill teams, like the the, the skill teams whose big guys are, you know, that can match a little bit of the quickness, maybe not be exactly as quick as they are because Drew Timmy, as of right now, and it's only two games, Drew Timmy is the leading rebounder in the team with eight. And then after that, I think it's like five. And then it's the two guard. It's like, oh, you're excuse me, your three man, which is, I think, Kispert. He's the next mm-hmm. leading rebounder. And so now we're, you're, you're one of your wings basically is your second leading rebounder and not like the next bigs. It's, I wonder how they'll do when a team attacks the glass on them or is physical with them, like in the future, later on in the season. Because when they get in the conference play, I don't know if that'll be an issue. I, it, they're just too talented for that. So I'm I'm wondering how in the non-conference play, how that'll come into effect. And not to mention, hopefully, Nimhard and uh, I can't, I keep messing up his, his last name. Ayayi? Uh, Ayayi. Yeah, Ayayi. Hopefully these guys, <laughs> Ayayi especially, can pick up He's only shot two free throws, so I can't really say too much about the free throw percentage. But the three-point shooting and and the consistency, like it's the first two games. These guys haven't played since March of last year. They haven't had any uh, scrimmage games or exhibitions or anything. They just got thrown into their first game against Kansas, and they did great. You know, this didn't slow Gonzaga down. I just wanted to – I would love to see this team not get slowed down at all. And I wonder – if the rebounding from the other guys, except for Drew Timmy, will pick up, hopefully it does. And we get some consistency as far as shooting because Nimhard and, and Ayayi played hard as hell. They did great. I thought as far as like, you know, it's easy for you to miss shots and then just sulk. Or mm-hmm. just like, oh, it's not my day. And these guys are getting all the, like, it's so easy to do that. And those two guys like stuck with it. They're obviously you could tell, obviously these guys are very good team guys. And that's what few brings there anyway. So I just hope that they can turn that, that inconsistency around for the next fall for the following games and show some, somebody else step up and show some rebounding. So that that'll kind of take that weary out of my mind about them being like, you know, what you just said, because I think of those great teams you mentioned, they all rebounded the hell out of the basketball. Well, I'll tell you what, man, they were we are too. on Wednesday. We are going to get an answer to that question. And that ladies and gentlemen is what we call a tease in the podcast industry, because we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about those games. There's four unbelievable games this week. Exactly. We are going to get to them uh, in, in a couple minutes as soon as we wrap up these questions. Question number two that I have, Deshaun. Yes, sir. Are you the most worried about Kansas, Kentucky, Virginia, 
or Villanova. Those were the four top 10 teams that lost this week. Which team are you most concerned about long term? When you say concerned, what do you mean exactly? What like who, which team do you think was maybe I don't know if the most overrated is the right term, but which one are you looking at now? And you're like, yeah, you know what? Maybe I was wrong thinking that that team was actually as good as I thought they were. All right. If I had to pick between Virginia, Villanova, Kansas, and Kentucky. All right. Kentucky, I was never on the ship because they have six guys that out of nine guys who play a ton of minutes in their freshman. So unless they were going to have the Carl Anthony Towns class or they were going to have the DeMarcus Cousins and John Wall class, then they weren't going to be those guys or that kind of team. So I wasn't really worried with Kentucky, not to mention what they have like 11 assists. They average like 11 and a half assists in two games and 18 turnovers. This, the, they, they have some things they need to work out. Yeah. Um, I think it was six assists and 21 turnovers in the loss to Richmond. Like that's, that's that ain't going to get, get it done. <laughs> <ain't gonna> get <laughs> it done. <laughs> Not going to cut it. So I, when I first saw the roster and I saw how many freshmen they had and B, BJ Boston's amazing, but I wasn't, I don't think I gave them that notch to be concerned now. I kind of feel like they are where I thought they would be and they'll get better because that's all you can do playing for a great coach like Cal and playing at Kentucky. Those fans will get to you one way or the other. So you'll play, you'll (laughs) play better. (laughs) Um, Villanova, not worried. Um, I wish they played better in overtime. And besides that, I felt like guys played great. JRE played amazing. The, the three games uh, he, didn't make any threes the last game, but he did everything else he possibly could. Shot the ball well from the free throw line. The field goal percentage is a little iffy, but I mean, he brings you so much and such he's such a foundational piece for their team. Like mm-hmm. you can't he can have that little off one, especially after having that 28 ball the night before, or whatever the case may be. So I'm not tripping on GRE and Gillespie and the guys. I think Villanova will be just fine. They, they lost to a, a good team. I can't. They, they played this team third, this team. Yeah, one and Virginia Tech runs such Virginia good Tech stuff, now. man. Like they, yeah. So how did, I, did you hear the story about when they agreed to it? It was 1 a.m. No. Friday morning. They agreed to play Virginia Tech on Saturday. So they basically had like 24 hours notice. And look, like Virginia Tech is it's not the most talented team in the world. But Mike Young runs like really, really difficult stuff to guard. Like it, if you've never seen them before and you've never played them before and you've never prepared and you haven't watched what they do on film, it's just hard to, to be able to figure out how to slow all that movement down and all those actions down. Like they have guys running off of pin downs on both sides of the floor and they get ball screens in there. It's just it's really, really good offense that he has his teams execute. And when you combine that with good players against a team that's playing their third game in four days that had some injury issues in the preseason that may or may not have had some COVID shutdowns uh, throughout the preseason. Like, it's just one of those things. So, yeah, I'm with you. I'm not that worried about Villanova. or Kansas. Not worried about Villanova. The last two, Kansas and – Virginia. Virginia. Virginia lost to San Fran. That sucked. I watched that one. <laughs> I'm not going to hold you. I was, I, I don't know if anybody like follow me on Twitter. I was like on an emotional high with Virginia. I was like, I was with them because I, I enjoyed it. Like just seeing these guys, they play, they, this is like my ultimate of like dream teams is to have a team where you have a four man, you have a great guards and wings. You have a four man that can step in and out and score. And you have a five man who can score in the paint as well as step out and catch you know, catch and shoot, knock down threes and protect the basket. Now he's not like a, a shot blocker, like on the ball. He's great. Like off the ball shot blocker. So he mm-hmm. protects the basket at all times. I love her. So watching them and I'm sitting, there, I'm like, yo, I, this team is, they do a lot. Like they have a lot of the spots filled that you want. Like, as far as like uh, what you want for a team, you know, you have a good inside outside guys, your foreman who can make plays off the dribble, can find people can score so you got your playmaker in the four spot, good wings, good guards, you know, and you have Huff down there who could protect the basket and also step out and knock down shots. And then you get to them playing San Fran and who rebounds when Huff's out there <laughs> just shooting jump shots and who, and if you can keep Hauser out the glass and like who's doing, and that's like always the biggest issue is that balance of, and I can see why people always used to knock Wiseman about it, but it's just like that balance of, 
getting outside shots up and then who's going to rebound the, the ball like and if that's not an emphasis you know if that's not made an emphasis on your team then you're just going to have five guys around the perimeter sooner or later mm-hmm. and you're getting shots up and then if a team can keep you from bo- I mean, getting the rebounds and getting offensive rebounds i mean and make plays like they had some trouble with those two those two quick guards that was another thing they couldn't guard the they couldn't guard the ball yeah. so it was it was very difficult for them to stay in front of the 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 two top guards so we're talking about their point guard and the shooting guard it was hard for them to stay in front of these guys and did you see what the guy's name was from uh from San Francisco by the way their their guard their best player the, his last uh, name is is Buya Buya his last name is Buya it was, Booyah it's, it's and pronounced Ali, right? was it Ali? Yeah, it's pronounced it's pronounced uh Bouye. Um, yeah. But it's it's spelled <laughs> Bouye. So like that dude is he's probably one of my five favorite players in America this year. That's a pretty dope name. <laughs> shout out to Stuart Scott, man. Yeah, that was a that was a hell of a win. So shout out to coach there cuz I mean, you don't get those First of all, sometimes you don't even get those scheduled games when you're that young of a coach and you get a top team like Virginia so, and you- So this is how wild it was. They didn't know that they were playing Virginia until they landed. San Francisco landed in Connecticut to go to the bubble bill. That's how wild the scheduling is. They did not know until they landed. People they make sure you take Virginia. that into account this year as well. Mm-hmm. Like for these first like three to four games, man, these guys didn't know who they, a lot of teams didn't know who they were playing. Like I've, I've played professionally. Like it's, it's annoying as hell. If your coach sets out a scout report and if somebody on that scout report <laughs> does something, that the coach said he couldn't do. Like, he's all oh, he can't shoot. Don't worry about him. If he makes a three, it's on me. And then he makes four threes and everybody's looking at you. And it's like, coach, what the fuck? Like, what are you doing? Like, so <laughs> you imagine, told me I didn't have to worry about yeah, that. You told me I didn't have to worry about him. So, like, imagine, like, these guys coming off the plane and it's just like the night before, it's like, all right, cool. This guy could do this. He could do this. He could do this. He could do this. Good luck. Like, let's work together as a team and win again. And it's like, come on, man. It's going to be very difficult for these guys to even come out and do this. So to answer your question, <laughs> Kansas, bro, I was I'm very worried about Kansas. <laughs> I just got to your question. <laughs> I'm very worried about Kansas. Like no lie, like it was very. All right, Gonzaga was like um, watching that Gonzaga game and let me know one of Kansas' biggest weaknesses off the rip is at the bigs and rebounding. Like mm-hmm. if you can have two bigs on the court at one time. And the Gonzaga has like four wings basically, and you can't beat them up on the glass. That's a problem. Then you have to take one of your bigs out and go smaller, playing into their hands, which is what they normally do. That's a problem. But I mean, Gonzaga came out, started really well, and then Kansas was there, and then they even came and cut it and brought it back. But you know, they they what was it? The the six were like sixteen to ten. Like there were spots where they shot a ton of Thompson shot a ton of tough shots. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can tell, like, just looking at the looking at the uh, the box score, it's just all right, cool. They're, everything was matched somewhat of the same thing. The only thing is they made more shots, and you look at the assists, and it's like, all right, cool. Well, either Kansas just didn't make the open shots that they had, and Gonzaga made more shots, or Kansas shot a lot of difficult shots. I was happy how Garrett played, but then he went to the next game and. I didn't see that. Like, I'm not seeing the consistency I'm looking for for our senior, you know, my senior leader that I'm picking to be an All American. I was very, I was hurt the second game. And you know what <laughs> really, man. I was very offended. And you know what really offended me the most is when they went and they beat St. Joe's as bad as they did, which shout out to St. Joe's. They're a very good team. And Kansas is a good team. But I kind of saw, I don't know, what, what would you say to this? You go out the next day and you beat St. Joe's really bad. But the day before where you have like a top five team where you can go ahead and, you know, get going. Like I was very disappointed at how Brian played because Brian showed out the next game and he looked amazing. And I was just like, where was the same energy? The yeah. Game no, no, no. I hear you. It kind of felt um, like it, I don't want to say front running because that's terrible to accuse players of because I don't want to accuse any college player of that because you always go out there and compete. But I just felt like the energy wasn't the same. And you go out there and you beat up on these guys at a St. Joe's, Kansas is supposed to. I mean, it's, it's basketball. Whoever wins, wins. But Kansas is yeah. the pick, pick to win that game. And it's like, we're expecting you guys to go out there and beat up on on this smaller team. Granted, Gonzaga's a good team, but it's a smaller team. And what? Are their big men had three rebounds that next game, too. So it's just, 
I don't know. I'm worried because uh, if I don't see that consistency from any of the upperclassmen and like, what do you expect? I mean, I can't see them. They got Kentucky coming up. Hopefully they can beat Kentucky because they're young and they average 30 turnovers a game. So like maybe they can beat Kentucky, but she, she's, if I'm Kentucky and I'm looking at this Kansas team, I'm like, well, we could possibly beat them up. Sars could beat them up on the glass and they can be in the game. And if they don't turn the ball over as much, it could be a game. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm with you for the most part on Kentucky. Like this is we should have expected them to start slow, especially without Keon Brooks, especially without a great point guard, Um, especially when you consider that they had like they they didn't have all of their typical buy games or the regular offseason to try to gel. Like it's very, very much a work in progress with them. And like we all knew knew this was coming. It should not be a surprise to anybody that this happened. Uh, I am with you on Villanova. Like it just, it was one of those things. They ran into a good Virginia tech team on their third game in four days at the start of a weird season. It happens. Um, I'm not quite as worried about Kansas as you are mm-hmm. mostly because I trust bill self to kind of figure it out. Um, I do think he's going to have to go five guards, like basically play full small ball and hope that Marcus Garrett can kind of defend whoever you need him to defend who are the other team's best player is. Um, like David McCormick is just not the answer, man. He's just, he can't, he can't defend. Like there's, there's one guy on go? Twitter that, where do you go that, from that keeps, that I, I don't, that's what I'm saying. No, like, man. Like he can't, he can't, big 12 he, is not, I don't know if that's the answer. <laughs> I, I like, think it's a better answer than, than putting McCormick out there. Now he'll work in certain matchups. I think like yeah. against, like against Marco Santos Silva of, of Texas yeah. tech. Exactly. Like, I think that he'll be fine. Like, cause that dude's not super quick and going up against West Virginia, he could probably hold his own because like he's big and physical and West Virginia's just going to try to be big and physical against you. Exactly. But when you go up, up against quicker play, like I don't know how he's going to play against Baylor. How do you put him out there against Mark vital or any of those guys? Like, it's just not going to work. work um, so I'm worried about them, but I do just kind of trust like Bill self will figure it out. Like he always figures something out like Bill self figured out yeah. to me. I'm most worried about Virginia. And the reason is they're like, so I did a deep dive on this over the weekend and they're running a new offense. So Tony Bennett has always been known for the mover blocker, which is basically like you got the two screeners and three people yeah. running off of them for like, for people that don't know, just three people running off of those screens. Uh, the year that he won the title, he implemented the ball screen continuity offense, which is basically just ball screen on one side of the floor you move, and then however the offense runs, you end up with a ball screen on the other side of the floor and the way that the offense flows and you end up with a ball screen on the other side of the floor. And it's just, it's literally a continuous ball, ball screen. screen offense, hence ball screen continuity. Um, <laughs> this year they're running something called uh, the five out read and react offense, which started with these guys that were coaching at a D3 program in Maine called St. Joseph's of Maine. And the idea of this offense is that you never have ball screens, you never have set plays, and the five guys on the floor space and never cross. So think about five guys around the perimeter or four guys around the perimeter. This when I was in college. And, yeah, and like one guy in the dunker spot. And if you drive right, everybody cuts right. Yeah. If you drive left, everybody cuts left. And you just play and you read and you react. And that's literally what it is. And – I think that in theory, that kind of makes sense. But one, I don't know if Virginia necessarily has the playmakers to be able to make that happen. And two, when your entire like system is based on structure and is based on execution, which is what Virginia does, like I feel like completely blowing that up and turning it into more or less like a freelance offense is a big, big step to take, especially when you did not have a normal off season to be able to practice the stuff yeah. and install the entire offense. So to me, that's why I'm the most concerned about Virginia. And I also think that they had the worst loss. Like I, I, I like Todd golden. I like San Francisco. Um, mm-hmm. Those guys are really, really smart, but we're talking about a team that lost like their two best players that is in the middle of the pack of the WCC. That is yeah. a complete also ran in a conference that is dominated by Gonzaga. So can't can't lose to them on the complete opposite side of the country from where they're from. So yeah, you definitely uh, can't lose to them. But uh, the yeah. reason I wasn't too worried is because even at their worst, they still had the opportunity to win the game. Yeah. They had a clean, clean jump shot, which my guy Hauser just shot short. So should have hit it. He should have hit it. I thought it was money personally. 
Yeah. But, and they're the best like three point defensive team that you're going to find with the pack line. And they, and San Francisco shot 13 for 27 from three. Like, yeah, sometimes it happens. So, it happens. It happens. Um, all right. Third question I have, and this is going to be the sweet spot for you uh-huh. is West Virginia, <laughs> the second best team of the big 12. And I say second best. Cause I think that we both agree, no matter, no matter how many West Virginia t-shirts you're going to put on, I that wish. Baylor is the best team in the Big I should grab another T-shirt right now and just throw it on. Nah, <laughs> I, in my heart of hearts, I definitely feel West Virginia is the best. But if we're going to go off of what we saw what we're gonna, and what we expect, I mean, West Virginia at the moment, yeah, by far. It's not even close. I kind of feel like it's not close. I think there's two teams mm-hmm. in the Big 12 that are the best teams far and away. Kansas can get there, obviously. I, and just like you said, Bill Self is a very smart guy. He's been doing this for too long. He's won too much to not be able to figure things out. So he won't be too far off, and Kansas won't be too far off. But I feel like West Virginia and Baylor are just there. Like, West Virginia, I don't even know. As far as, like, you just brought up physically, like, what they do with the big. I don't know many teams in the conference that can do that. Our shooters are starting to get a little bit more confidence, which was awesome to see this weekend. Because going off of last year, we didn't see much of that. We just saw a ton of misses, like you said. And even in the first half in a couple of these games, I was texting you. I was like, oh, my God, I know mm-hmm. I'm going to hear it. I'm going to hear it from you when we start next week. And then they came in the second half, and they started making shots, and you could see the confidence going. So I was very, very happy with my Mountaineers this weekend because I can come here on the show with my head held high in a, in a crossover. Uh, what is it? The and wear your T-shirt, Probably. man. Wear your Nike shirt. <laughs> My, no, my in, all, in all serious though, like, like Taj Sherman, who is that dude? Where did he come from? Why did Taj I know about him? Sherman. First and hey, foremost, he's a he's a bucket. Yes. He is a bucket. This is a dude. Once again, like before, I decided to retire. I I'm in the gym every day. I'm working out. Taj Sherman is in the gym every day working out. Very 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 hard worker. Very skilled player. You won't see as much of it right now because you know Hugs is very uh, demanding of our players, but. Taz has a lot to his game, ball handling wise, a lot to his game as far as scoring the basketball, not just a catch and shoot kind of guy. Um, we're talking about somebody that was a top four scorer in the, in the junior college in the country, as well as his other his other wing partner, Sean McNeil, mm-hmm. who led the country in scoring in junior college. So we got these dudes who can really we they, they are proven scorers. It's just it takes some time to get accustomed to playing defense for two hours every day in practice. It's tough. <laughs> and once you get your legs settled, and I felt like Sean and Taz were getting there last season, and the season got cut short, and they didn't get a chance to, you know, show what they can do. And now they're getting that opportunity with a ton of work in the summer to prove and show everybody they can do these things. I, yeah, I want I mean, some more consistency from Emmett Matthews, though. I love Emmett. Great player. I played against him. <laughs> I feel like you're talking directly to him right now. I'm like talking his to father. you, right? I'm looking right at you. Like, I need better, bro. Like, you're, he's such a sick – he's a sick athlete, great defender, great shooter. He just has to get his confidence together. He's had some uh, some tough uh, – some hardships. So, I got Emmett. Let's go. Step it up. Step it up. Yeah, and the last point, I, I agree with everything you just said. You know, if you have um, – we, we all knew how good uh, Miles McBride would be as a scorer. Yeah. yeah. And as long as you have – more help for him when it comes to creating space and making shots uh, that changes everything for West Virginia in my mind. So I'm, I'm very much in on them. Um, I'm buying them top 10 team, top 15 team. I, I think that they can get to a final four. I'm not going to say they're the best team in the big 12 because yeah, I think Baylor is, is very, very real and very, very tough <laughs> and very, very good. Um, <laughs> but the last point I want to make is like, people are going to look at the teams that they beat in, uh, in South Dakota and see South Dakota state, and see VCU and see Western Kentucky and think like, oh, yeah, they just beat up on a bunch of mid-majors or whatever. Well, one, South Dakota State is like the best mid-major kind of in that region, right? They're always getting to tournaments. They've come close to winning games and tournaments. They've sent two different guys to the NBA in the last six years. Like, that's a really good program, uh, top 100 program in the country probably. And getting that – like beating them – in their home state is not an easy thing to do. So that's that's a good win. VCU, we should all know how good VCU is. I, I don't think they're the best team in the A-10 this year, but they're a top four team in the A-10. And yeah. beating a team like that on a neutral floor is never going to be an easy thing to do. That'll probably be a quad two win once the NCAA tournament comes around. And then Western Kentucky, like we saw them take apart Memphis. Like the, the uh, Tevion Hollingsworth, I think that's his name. Yeah. That dude can go. Oh, yeah. Charles Bassey was a top 10 prospect coming out of high school 
right? The uh, the uh, what's his name? Um, is it Jacob Anderson? Whatever the big wing is, the big athletic dude they have on the wing. Um, Connor Williams, like Mace, like Connor Williams, honestly would have been perfect. The big white dude on Western Kentucky would have yeah. been perfect for West Virginia. He misses calling. Like the way the, the <laughs> toughness, the defense getting to the offensive glass. Like it's like he was tailor made to play for Bob Huggins. He just kind of ended up at Western Kentucky. So uh, made yeah, I mean, those us. are. <laughs> those aren't those aren't three great wins. Like it's not going to move the needle. It's not going to make you say, "Oh my gosh!" Like West yeah. West Virginia can win a national title. But those are three quality wins against three quality basketball teams where it never felt like it was really in doubt for West Virginia. So like those, got to give them credit. They got Gonzaga coming up, and we are going to talk about that. I promise. Uh, but two more questions for you: What was the most impressive individual performance that you saw this weekend? All right. Uh, I kind of had like a split in the scenario. Luca Garza was amazing. <laughs> the four, he scored yeah, 36, 36 points in one half, bro. <laughs> half. That was amazing. Like what he can do with the basketball as far as like he, he gets his back to the basket, he gets the ball in his hands, being able to fade away, being able to go left, right hand. Like he's a talent. And that, that fadeaway is new, by the way. We got to start calling him Dirk I saw, Garza. I saw a little bit. I saw a little bit of it last season, just a little bit when I did some, some research and like I saw a little bit because I want to see if he worked on some things. And I saw more of it this this season than last, though. So he's definitely worked on these things. I got to put an asterisk next to it because not because it was like it's no one can just score 40 in a college game. Like it's that like it's, you still have to put the points up. So there's no big deal. But he was that it was Southern, correct? Mm hmm. I'm sorry. I just love JRE, man. Jeremiah Robinson Earl was out there. 28 points, nine boards, just be like. I just love I love his game, man. He 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 can shoot the ball from three. He can shoot mid range. He's just everywhere in the court for rebounds. He's a great defender for his team. Like I just, I it was kind of like I wouldn't say it was a tie, but it was just like I'm fighting because when Villanova's Those playing, are your guys, man, that's your guy, JRE. You got to ride for him. I love Jay Wright, but they're playing a ton of competition, and Iowa wasn't <laughs> so. But I did want to change my take on the Big Ten. I want to apologize to everybody in the Big Ten, Big Ten family. The fans, <laughs> the players, everybody, Big Ten smacked me in the mouth this weekend. So I want to apologize to all of you guys because great, great conference. Great conference. <laughs> I was completely off my rocker. And then I look at the Big 12, and the Big 12 didn't look so big this weekend <laughs> in, comparison to, <laughs> in comparison to the Big uh, 10. So. Wasn't, wasn't a good weekend for the Big 12. No, um, <laughs> so my, my most impressive performance, uh, I loved what Jalen Suggs did. I thought Io Desunmu like completely lived up to the expectations of being a uh, like a first team All American potential Big Ten Player of the Year. Like he was he was awesome in three games. Uh, but I'm going to go with Jason Preston from Ohio, the point guard they got. And I, I just first of all, I love that kid's story. I don't know if you caught that on the broadcast. Yeah. He uh, when he was a senior in high school, he was six foot, 140 pounds, playing in Orlando. He was supposed to go to UCF just to be a student. Like he wasn't going to walk on. He wasn't going to try to play ball, nothing. He was just going to go to be a student, playing intramurals, play rec league, play church league, whatever. Um, he ended up latching on with a prep school. And like the prep school had three different levels, A teams, B teams, and C teams. He started out on the C team, played his way up to the A team, but ended up getting sent back down to the C team, had a triple double in a game, takes the highlights from that triple double, Puts him into like uh, the, some Twitter video, two minutes, 20 seconds long, posts it onto Twitter, gets offered by, I want to say it was some small low major in the South that I can never remember, and Ohio. So he had two Division One offers off of a mixtape that he put together from a C-level prep school game after averaging two points as a six-foot senior in high school for Boone High School in, uh, in, in Orlando, Florida. Gets to Ohio and grows. He's 6'4 now. He weighs a buck 90 and he's like his, his ball screen game, man, he is something else. And the reason why I loved it so much is because I think that Jeff Bowles, the Ohio coach did something in that game that you never see college coaches do, at least not enough. He found a matchup that he could exploit and he went after it every single possession. All he did was he took this, this point guard that he has that is elite in ball screens and made sure that whoever Kofi Coburn was guarding, set that ball screen, and then just said, Jason Preston, go. Go yeah. do your thing. 
And it, they should have they should have beaten Illinois in Illinois as a result of it. It was just it was so much fun to watch. Jason Preston is like I'm every time Ohio's on, I'm gonna be watching that dude. I honestly think that he'll he'll play in the NBA at some point, whether it's like a two-way contract, um, whether it's like at the end of the bench somewhere. Like he will at some point in his life have an NBA jersey and get a paycheck from an NBA team. Um, and the fact that like he made it there from being a, a dude that was just gonna go to UCF, like incredible story. Incredible performance at Illinois. He outplayed Io DeSumo in Io DeSumo's house, even though he didn't get the win. So shout out to Jason Pressman. That was fun. Very much so. All right. Last question, and then we're going to get to a preview of the weekend, and then we're going to get the hell out of here, Deshaun. Uh, what team have you changed your opinion on the most after after watching their first whatever games after five days? Michigan State. Yeah. Like I said, big time. Apologize. Illinois was in that conversation, too. I, I – Seeing Dunsumu play and seeing Ant Miller and those guys play, like it was, it was a, uh, it was eye opening how fast they were and how yeah. good the conference is. Seeing, I really thought that because Winston wasn't going to be there, that this team wasn't going to be as strong, Michigan State. But then they came out and played a collectively great team basketball. They played collectively great team basketball uh, against what is it? Uh, was that Eastern Michigan? Yeah, Eastern Michigan, and then they they yeah. they beat the brakes off Notre Dame. Yeah. They were up twenty eight in the second half against Notre yeah, Dame, like it was, and it's just like seeing them be be able to play together like that. Play what like I just didn't see it happening. So once again, big time. <laughs> Sorry, because <laughs> I was I'm a believer between Miller, Nasumu, and Cochran and Illinois. Like I I saw a lot of great basketball this weekend, so I'm pick. I would say yeah. Just Illinois will be my really pick, but you know, so the the Big Ten as a whole for you, man. Like, yeah, let's yeah, be man. honest, was, the Big Ten proved a lot of things to Deshaun Butler this weekend. Yeah, they slapped me in the they slapped me in the face. They punched me in the mouth this weekend. <laughs> man. Ohio State, every they just all of them came out and took care of business early. Mm-hmm. Where I look at all the most of the Big Twelve games were either close or losses, and it was it was a, it was a fight for the Big Twelve to get their wins like the big 10 kind of went out there and they did everything they were supposed to do. They follow script Took care of their business. Anybody, any money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for me, it's Duke. Mm. And last time we were on this podcast, I tried to explain to you why I thought that Duke was so undervalued heading into this season. And I've never regretted saying anything more in my entire life than going on a two minute rant about why I thought Duke was so undervalued. That team is – they're going to have some problems this year. <laughs> um, and the biggest thing, like – so I, I, there's just no rim protection. You know, they're playing Jalen Johnson at the five, and, like, Jalen Johnson is kind of probably the closest thing that we've seen to Ben Simmons in college since Ben Simmons was in college in terms of, like, his size and athleticism and mm-hmm. handle and passing ability. They're playing him at the five next to Matthew Hurt. Matthew Hurt can't guard anyone. They started Joey Baker. Joey Baker can't guard anyone. They started Jordan Goldwire. Jordan Goldwire is a complete zero offensively. Like, he can make some plays and ball screens, but he can't shoot. Uh, not really a threat. So, the fact that they started those three guys, Goldwire, Baker, and Hurt, is a, like a major red flag to me. Um, I don't know how they guard anyone without any kind of rim protection. It just it does not seem uh, like – a very smart strategy to have the guy that's going to be the, the the catalyst of your offense and Jalen Johnson also be the guy that you're relying on for kind of rim protection. You know, that's a yeah. very risky way to get to do two fouls in the first half, like every single game where you play maybe, someone good. Maybe if he was like a four, but the, 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 the main five, like the five man, nah, that's, that's because yeah, even a force can get a rebound and push, but him having the guard on ball, he's getting pushed. Like that's going to be difficult to, yeah, and but like they don't have another option. option like that, exactly. the, Mark Williams is just like he's gonna be good. Like you could see the size and the length he has. Um, he's not, he's not ready yet. Um, so it, it's that's a concern for me. No rim protection. The other part of it is like I don't like teams where like if you put their best defensive five on the floor and their best offensive five on the floor, yeah. and there's like three or four guys that are different on those two teams. Like they don't have two way players. They have guys like Matthew Hurt is a great floor spacer, but he can't really guard anyone. 
Um, you have Wendell Moore, who should be like a really good defender, but like, what is he on the offensive end? G- DJ Stewart is an absolute bucky. He had 24 against Coppin State, but he's also like 6'2, 6'3, probably a buck 75. Kind of got beat up a little bit against Coppin State. So I think that Duke at this point, like right now, I think they're probably closer to like a top 25 team borderline top 25 team than they are a top 10 team which is where everyone had them um and when it comes to like kentucky or kansas or some of these other programs we were talking about like i see paths to those teams becoming really good again like getting back into that top 10 conversation and i just don't know what the path is for this duke team to get back into the conversation of being like a a legitimate final four contender and and so i'm very very concerned about how bad my take was the last time we podcasted. They probably got a recruiting class coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you see a teams like this, like look as bad as you think they do, then somebody out of nowhere, this recruiting class comes in where they have the best players in the world. Yeah, all, all of a sudden you have all Americans that are transferring in as grad transfers. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. All right. Uh, we have four awesome games this week. On Tuesday, we have the Champions Classic. Michigan State is going to be playing at Duke and Cameron Indoor Stadium in front of zero fans, while Kentucky and Kansas are going to be playing uh, at Bankers Life Fieldhouse in Indianapolis. It's not going to be the same as it normally is for the Champions Classic, but we are going to get those games back to back. I'm guessing that we're both going to be picking the same teams here based off of what we said. So Michigan State at Duke, what do you like there, and how do you think that plays out? Uh, I'm going to go with Duke, bro. I'm not going to lie. Duke? probably don't. I'm taking Duke. Like, I, I'm going to take Duke. Like, they're, they're at home. And granted, it's not like the, the Cameron Crazy is going to be in there, but I feel I got a feeling that – He's been, they he's got the be, camera and crazy cutouts, though. They got the cardboard yeah. cutouts. So. <laughs> they got the cardboard cutouts there. They'll, they'll yeah. be enough for them to, to to edge Michigan State. Grant, I said I'm sorry to the Big Ten, but I still think that Duke will beat Michigan State. And I'll probably go with Kansas against Kentucky. Mm-hmm. I feel like um, B.J. Boston is good, man. But I feel like Garrett and the rest of the guys will, will come together and, and stop stop whatever Kentucky's doing. I mean, Kentucky's just very turnover prone and it's just, and they're so young, man. Like young, man. the thing it's about just... Kansas is like, there's, there's a lot of veterans on that team. Yeah. And at this point in the season, you got to take veterans against this Kentucky team. It just, exactly. it is what it is. Kentucky fans. Like you got a young team. Um, a I young... will disagree with you on Michigan state though. I think that they, they go into Cameron indoor and like, I, I kind of think they win by like 10 or 12. So. And maybe, maybe I'm just like completely overreacting here. But I just I, I think there are real problems at Duke. Like they Duke made two dudes on Coppin State look like all Americans. I, I can't let me let me bring up a box score so I can get their names. But there were two guys on Coppin State that both had 22 points in but that in happens though. That Duke. happens, Rob. That happens sometimes. These guys are jacked up about playing Duke. Man, that happens. I watched, I remember when I was in college, I watched Belmont give Duke uh, they almost beat Duke in the tournament. Yeah, and and I watched Belmont's it. Like, a really good team, happen. and like I get it, but like Coppin <laughs> State, yeah, Coppin true. State shouldn't be going into Cameron Indoor Stadium and and doing that. So no excuses, I don't know. Excuses, maybe, right. maybe maybe you're right, but it just it, when I watched that game, like I, I I watched it, I watched it on Synergy, um, and it was just like it was surprising to me how concerned I was about about Duke and the way that all those pieces fit together. <laughs> all right, so uh, we're gonna talk about Gonzaga and West Virginia lasts so you got to save your your takes you got to save your explanations for why um, uh, west virginia is going to win that game by 35 um for (laughs) a little bit let's start with okay (laughs) illinois illinois baylor they're going to be playing at bankers life Fieldhouse in indianapolis it's the jimmy v classic um it's the second game of that night uh and i think that this is the game that i'm the most excited for this week just i mean these are you get Iota Sumu against Jared Butler. You get an, a top five Illinois team against a top two Baylor team. So what do you like in that game? How do you see that playing out? Man, I feel like I feel like this is a cop out with tempo. Tempo is how I figure how this game would go. Like there's a lot of specialists on the court where a lot of the guys in Illinois, they run. The, their best players run. Their big run, their bigs run to keep up so they can get the ball. They have to with the point guard like him. So if they if they speed they speed Baylor up, man, I kind of feel like it goes into their hands. Baylor, I feel like they have good defenders. 
they're great half court defenders, especially though. So if you get them before they can set up and you can just mm-hmm. rebound and get going, get the ball in uh, the, uh, someone's hands and then just get going or get the ball in Miller's hands quick and they get going, it could be a problem. But if Baylor slows them down, I don't think it'd be, it'll be the kind of game that Illinois wants to be a part of. Yeah, and I'm, yeah I, Baylor, I agree with you there. Yeah. The transition <laughs> game is going to be so important for Illinois. Like if, if yeah. you can beat them down the floor and you don't have to go up against that, that they, it's – that defense that Scott Drew plays is so it's so unique, man. Like they they don't allow anybody middle. They basically zone up on the weak side of the floor. So you got like man to man on one half of the floor, zone on the other side. They want to just force everybody drive baseline, mm-hmm. and that's not necessarily a normal thing in college basketball. Most people want you to drive middle to where you have help. Baylor sends all their help to the baseline. It's just it's a weird defense. It's not an easy defense to play. It's especially when you have guys like Mark Vidal and Davion Mitchell out there who can really, really guard. Um, so I think the transition game is important. I do think Baylor gets it done. Uh, they just have – they have too many guards, and I think that their ability to uh, kind of space everything out offensively is going to gonna matter. Like Adam Flagler and LJ Cryer have looked really, really good early on this season. Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, to me that's kind of like a, a coin flip game, but I, I tend to think Baylor will get the job done there. All yeah, right, I'll and then uh, lastly, we Taylor, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, lastly, West Virginia, Gonzaga, Deshaun, tell me why you think West Virginia is going to win by twenty five. <laughs> oh. <laughs> twenty five would be that'd be pushing. I don't even think there'd be a line out there that I have West Virginia winning by twenty five. But what I will say is, what I expected from from Kansas, you with their height and their size. I definitely know I will be getting from West Virginia as far as controlling the rebounds. The one thing that you won't change for West Virginia is rebounding. They're going to rebound Mm -hmm. the basketball. So everything basically comes down to, are we going to, when I say we, I mean, West Virginia, shout out to my West Virginia people. Are we (laughs) going to make shots? One, that's very important. Our guys, Miles McBride is Tash Sherman is uh, Sean McNeil is, is anybody else going to make any jump shots to stretch the perimeter so we can get the ball inside and do some damage with Oscar and do some damage with Derek Culver MVP. And um, <clears throat> if we do those things, I, I got a feeling that the game will be closer than it's supposed to be. And if it is, I don't see how West Virginia doesn't win the game, but if they just go there and they have the first half that they had the last two games, shit, three games, Ah, uh, Gonzaga is just so they just there's just a lot of talent offensively. Like it's just it's a lot. I don't see them doing anything too crazy defensively, but offensively, the way few has those guys, they, they they just have a lot, they have a lot offensively, man. They can they can score the ball from three, they have three-point shooters everywhere, they have guys that are, can, can attack the basket, they use the pick and roll re- very, very well, and they find the guys in the pick and roll very well, whether rolling or replacing. They do a great job of just running their offense. So if our guys don't come out there defensively and do what we're supposed to do, and they're not knocking down shots, and all we're doing is relying on rebounding, it can be a rough night. But if we make shots, I got West Virginia by like five, man. Yeah. So I I think the offensive rebounding for West Virginia, it's not just their opportunity to get second chance points. Um, it's also – the fact that if they do, if they crash the glass and they don't get that offensive rebound, Gonzaga is lethal in transition. They are so fast getting up and down the floor. Um, if you if you if you crash glass, you send three guys to the glass. Like you're, you're going to give up a layup at the other end. So you better get that offensive rebound. So um, I think the game is going to be won on on the glass right there on on uh, West Virginia's offensive glass. So you even know uh, the record between a uh, few uh, uh, West Virginia and. and- Gonzaga at the moment, <laughs> it's, it's not looking good at all. I don't, I can't remember a time where I've seen Gonzaga lose to West Virginia. So hopefully this will be that time. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this much: <laughs> if, if Gonzaga <clears throat> beats West Virginia on Wednesday, and they beat Baylor on Saturday, they're going undefeated. Yes, yeah, so I, a I legitimately deal. think they go undefeated but, uh, this season. I don't see anybody beating them in their conference at all, and I feel like they have they have a solid non conference schedule after. After Baylor, but it's ba- like the last, them. yeah, the last team they play is mm-hmm. Iowa, and I just don't think Iowa can yeah. slow them down. Not enough. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, if they if they if they go two and zero this week, uh, they're going to go undefeated. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that, I mean, it's going to come down to whoever's in the final four, if someone can get them. So um, we'll see how that goes. I, I, I think Gonzaga probably ends up winning, but I'm just saying that because I think Gonzaga is the, the, the best team that we've seen since 2018 Villanova. I just think that they're absolutely loaded. So um, with that, Deshaun, Appreciate you again. Another great podcast. Uh, as always, if you guys are this far into the podcast, if you're listening to me say this right now, hit that subscribe button, rate it, review it, share it, tell your friends about it, tell all your West Virginia homies to tweet at Homefield Apparel. No E in apparel. Real friends. Real friends. 